I'm Lee Brown, and this is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. Today's conversation is really for my real estate pros who perhaps need some counsel when it comes to their own finances, which is also information you can transfer to your clients. And if you're not in real estate, you probably need this advice too. So enjoy this conversation with Sarah Ponder. She's a certified financial planner. And frankly, she does have a little bit of language that might need earmuffs if you have little people, but it's totally worth it and great. So just enjoy the conversation. I'll see you on the other side. Hi, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? How are you? It is fine. We are at an Airbnb in Bentonville, Arkansas. Nice. For a month. And I'm realizing they like decorated it with it's just like garlic. So I'm going to take that day. I don't know. If he's tired of the so maybe a vampire was going to log into the episode and they've now run for the hills. I was wondering if this longer burger behind you, because that's definitely really expensive basketry that should be decorative. But I don't really know if it's just what they found. In- I don't know. I don't know. It's just like what it is. It's how they like decorated. Well, it was a hat too. Two hats. Yeah. There's a couple of hats in like all the bedrooms. We have toddlers and they're like, oh, no, God, leave the so I'd probably let them play with the hats and then hang it back on the wall. But that would make me a bad Airbnb guest. You didn't hear me say that. Don't give me less than five stars. I know. I know. That's because I love Airbnb. So good morning and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So tell us a little bit about who Sarah is. And if we have viewers and listeners that don't know how hard it is to become a certified financial planner, you can toss in anything about your credentials. But give them a oh, yeah. story before we dig in. Absolutely. Well, I'm Sarah Ponder. I am the owner and founder of Real Estate Wealth Planning, which is a fee-only fiduciary financial planning word, the whole shit ton of F words right there. <laughs> I mean, really, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> In fact, I, like, I send folks this video at the beginning that's like, what are all these F words? Fee-only, fiduciary, financial planner. I'm not going to get into that today because we don't really have the time, but why not? <laughs> so, and based in Austin, Texas, I primarily work with real estate professionals as clients. And then I also work with your clients as an investment manager, financial planner, whenever they've got an inheritance, move up, move down, you know, whatever they kind of need. But let me tell you about how hard it is to become a certified financial planner. It is hard. It's a tough test. I, this actually is a like crazy shit story. So my husband is a real estate agent which is how I started working with real estate agents. And long story short, I have a bachelor's degree in sociology, which is not as useless as it sounds. Not when you're Uh talking with your husband about his clients, you're like, hey, baby, try this. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Exactly. No, it's the study of people, which is great in sales and relationships. My mother definitely like handed me a job you can get with a sociology degree in 2006 when I graduated and I did not take any of those jobs. So long story short, I've had a lot of careers and worked with a lot of different people. And somehow I ended up after my MBA getting a job at an investment firm here in Austin called Dimensional Fund Advisors. Great firm. I use a lot of their products currently with my client portfolios, basically because they're cheap and easy. But here's the funny story. I don't know why they hired me in the first place (laughs) because I didn't have a financial. I mean, I like people skills and I had an MBA and like taking two finance classes. I still don't know why they hired me, but I had a great time while I was there and they offered to pay for my CFP. And I thought it would be a good idea to just do that over maternity leave. Like, why not? So, wait a minute. So, I had a first baby when you did not know what you were doing. Yeah. So, it started with the first baby. So it gets better. So, and my first baby, our Lucy, February of 2018. So she's five and she's a couple of weeks old. And I'm like, okay, it's probably time to start doing my coursework. So I start doing my online coursework on that maternity leave. I go back to work, shit gets a little hard for the next few months. I kind of put it off and then I get pregnant again. A second baby, Hank, um, they're 18 months apart. So it's uh, August of 2019. And oh, it gets better. And you have to complete six courses to get a CFP. And I did them online, self-paced. And then you got to do this like capstone project. And Hank is due on August 24th of 2019, which is, I think, a Thursday or a Friday, something like that. And it's August in Texas and it is like real fucking hot. 
real hot. Yeah. <laughs> so it's okay to say that, right? I have an E on my... <laughs> I'm pretty proud of that little black E. <laughs> and so I was like, this baby is coming out by August 20th. I need those four extra days of like not being this hot. So August 20th is a Tuesday. I was supposed to get induced with him on that Tuesday. The Friday before, I am like working my ass off to get this, uh, this like little presentation thing done and turned in. And I start having contractions. Because of course, <laughs> like, I'm like, now we and so another way, I mean, getting away all this personality <laughs> on that day right there. He's something. So lucky for me, it was just false labor, which is apparently very common in your second. So we were, we went to the hospital and then your contraction slowed down a few hours later. So I get home and I like bust my ass to get that thing done. And I turn it on Sunday. And then, you know, lo and behold, I get induced on Tuesday and he comes like a freight train. No meds, no nothing. That doctor had to run into that hospital to catch the baby. I like, I get there, they induce me at like, I don't know, 7, 7.30. And it's like not going very quickly. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to be here all day. And I'm like, no, no, I'm hungry. I'm going to have lunch. <laughs> and they have to break my water about 930. And they're like, it's still going to be a while. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to have lunch. That baby is born by 1130. Mm. And I had lunch. <laughs> and your third baby's going to get here in like five minutes. So you should be aware of that. So the funny thing is she took a while. Oh, this, uh, yeah. <laughs> Same protocol, but she waited till like freaking 9 or 10 p.m. I was really upset about that. And so what was your grade on that capstone project that you're finished? That's the only one I got an A on. Everything else I got a B because I am like really good at getting Bs. But then, so after you finish all these courses, you then have to actually take an exam. And I don't know what the pass rate is. It's probably 60% or something. It's like the number of people who take it and actually pass the first time. So I did pass. That's the punchline, obviously, because my... <laughs> I heard those letters slide my name. <laughs> but the exam is two parts, three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. And I was like, mm, I don't know, six weeks postpartum, maybe eight, something like that. Which means I had to pump. <laughs> sleep and emotionally do this. Yep. Yep. So luckily, Hank was a great sleeper. So and I had some like time built in and some help to help me study. But I only had enough time to study. I studied like around the clock for like a month before that test and then took the morning portion, went to my car, parked by a fence, pumped during lunch and then took the afternoon portion and passed. And just for the record, you're probably the only CFP on the planet who got it done on the first time that fast and pumped in between segments. But y'all, you have to know when you're looking at financial people, (laughs) CFPs are rare like really rare because of the amount of time it takes to yeah. the homework to get through those classes. So it's a big deal, but to pump your way through it means you probably don't have to update your marketing somehow because it. <laughs> you know the funny pump um, through the CFP. Ponder how she can do all the things at the studio. right. You would use your name in a thousand ways. So the funny thing is, I had actually totally blocked that memory out. Until a year or two ago, I was in the airport. I'd gone to a financial planning conference um, with some of my peers. And it's kind of a big conference. There's probably like 500 of us there. So I didn't know everybody there. But I ended up catching an Uber to the airport with somebody who I hadn't met at the conference. Very nice mid-40s or 50s guy. And he was asking me about my CFP. I told him the basics of the story. But I left out the part about pumping because I, honest to God, did not remember it. And then he asked me, he was like, oh, I bet you had to pump like while you're taking that test. And I was like, oh my God, I did. I did. <laughs> and I like now very clearly remember moving my car so that I'm like right in front of a fence and not right in front of the fucking door. <laughs> Wife must have just had a kid for him to be that focused on the pump. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think he may have. But yeah, so he like literally brought that memory back for me. All right. So you're kind of a unicorn in the financial planner space because the vast majority that we encounter on the real estate side are very anti-real estate and they would actually... And they're men. (laughs) Well, that's very true. But (laughs) they'll tell them just do the equities market. If you're nervous, do some bonds over here. Let's toss in some muni and let's do some easy spiders. They want to give them everything except real estate. And one of the things we desperately need as real estate counselors is financial partners who can say, yes, 
real estate has a place as part of your diversification strategy, especially if we're working with multiple property investors who got to talk 1031s and they got to do some complicated advanced tax strategies. So I'd love to know how you start that conversation with an investor, Mm -hmm. a normal setup. So like the normal person who's 401k rolled over to their IRA, now they've got a hundred grand sitting in their account. They've only ever had the Vanguard funds that came from their company. They call me as their real estate pro and say, I want to invest. One of the first things I say is let's talk the financial strategy. Let's talk about the tax picture. How do we set everything up? Because we got to have a whole team. Where do you start somebody when they come to you with a lump sum and say part of this should be in real estate? That's a great question. My answer is probably not what you'd expect. And because everybody is different. And I know like that's sort of an adage, but it is honest to God true. And rules of thumb, they're great for most people. And I'll give you a couple. One is I would say most of my clients are kind of 50% equities, cash, bonds, whatever, and probably 50% real estate. You know, somewhere in that like 40 to 60 band, basically. But it's not for everybody. I have some clients that are 100% one way or the other. And the reason honestly just boils down to like who you are and like what your life is like and what liabilities you have coming up, what kind of cash flow needs you have. Like, are you about to pay 200 grand for college over the next couple of years? If so, you probably need to have some cash on hand in some form or fashion. Not that I'm suggesting you do that, but, you know, some people have already committed to something, right? And so they're already in that book. And so everyone's life is different. That's the first thing I'll say. So my process is to take in some data, but then I don't give any answers until after we've had what I call an imagination vision meeting, where we really map out how you really want to spend your time and your treasure and what your vision and values are. Because if you don't do that, I can't tell you what the best place is to put your money. Because at the end of the day, almost any investment is fine. Almost. As long as the investment makes sense to you, makes sense to your goals, and is economically viable, it's fine. Like, Our goal here is not literally to get the very best returns. Our goal here is to fund the life that you want to have. And for some people, that means a stock portfolio. I mean, maybe you inherit it and you've got some capital gain. That happening all the time with clients. Maybe it's real estate that you plan to hold 15, 20, 25 years. Or it could be a mix of the two. So there's not a prescription. The only prescription I have is that you have to do some life planning and identify how you want to spend your time and your treasure, meaning your dollars and your cents, and what are your vision and what's your values. And after we know that, then we'll talk about strategy. So funny because that's so intuitively basic. And it's one thing we have a hard time getting clients to do is sit down and think about things before things which is wild because that money does burn a hole in your pocket or they want mm-hmm. a webinar or saw some Instagram post. Yep. What do you say? Yep. Invest here and make the money. Here's an investment. I'll write you a check. You're yep. like, whoa. Wait, whoa. And I had somebody call me last yep. week. I want to have some investment real estate. I said, great, let's chat about it. They said, no, send me some properties. I'm like, I could send you everything in the market because it could all be a different kind of investment, but mm-hmm. they're not all suited for everybody. I buy inexpensive C-class multifamily because I want to provide affordable housing. A lot of people don't have for that, but that's yep. okay. So now let me yep. ask a question because when you're thinking about this, imagine would you say imagination vision session? Uh-huh. Yeah. So if you're going to have an imagination vision session with a top producing realtor, which I know that's one of your specialty groups that you yep. serve, our people make a lot, spend a lot. Well, <laughs> Spend it all. Max spends it all. Make Max spend it all. And then they start selling more houses. And so then they make more and then they take more. And then they make more and then they spend more. And I have found in my years of coaching professionals that realtors have a very hard time not spending everything they make. And then they get to a panic point at some point Mm -hmm. in their personal life and say, Holy shit, I don't have a 401k or a Mm pension. And maybe they no longer have a spouse and they're thinking it's, um, I'm, 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 uh, uh, yeah. 
what is your strategy for structuring that imagination session for a commission-led life where somebody may have a high level of success and that also mm-hmm. comes with a little bit of, how do we say it nicely, ego, that they would mm-hmm. have to sign, mm-hmm. listen to the Sarah Ponder advice on things. So a little insight. Yeah. You know. yeah. They're all listening. So. About, they know who I've called out. <laughs> I just called you out. Go ahead and hit me up in the comments and I'll send you. And if you're already my client and that's your story and you know who you are, you better be looking ones too. No, your client should reply to my people who are commenting now and say, actually, you should listen to Sarah and yeah. newly stepped on your toes. So carry on. <laughs> All right. Let me blow your mind here, Lee. There are two ways to get wealthy. Okay. There's actually three ways to get wealthy. Let me define wealth first. Wealth is the ability to wake up in the morning and do whatever the fuck you want to do. If you are remotely awake, then you know that we are heading into some really tricky economic times. We have home buyers that have put the kibosh on buying because they have interest rate shock. We have sellers who have found out suddenly their houses aren't dipped in 14 karat gold. And as a realtor, you are still trying to keep up with the business you have and trying to answer questions in the meantime, while also managing sky high fuel cost at the pump. Never fear because my new video course is coming out right now and it's called how to dominate during a recession. Look, I've been a realtor for 22 years. I came through the last recession by the skin of my teeth, actually not even the skin of my teeth. My business went up every year during the great recession and it's all because of education and getting in front of the curve so that I could serve as many neighbors as possible and help them weather this storm as well. So this course is four modules. There might even be some bonus content for you. And I have priced it so that everybody can get a hold of it and go out there and do great things for the American dream and for home ownership. The price is $199. Click on this link. If you take action, you can be the one who brings great information and great solutions and also paired with realism and optimism into the marketplace that you serve. I am delighted to bring this out as quickly as possible because friends, there's no time like the present to make sure our neighbors are stronger and we protect the American dream. That is wealth. It is not a number. So wipe that out of your brain. Wipe it out of your brain. Say it again, mama, say it again for the people in the back. Wealth, wealth is the ability to wake up in the morning and do whatever the fuck you want to do. <laughs> full it's, not stop. it's not rocket science. It is not rocket science. And who you listen to what your children are listening to. Well, you're not. My, my children are 17 and 18. So at some point, Lucy and Hank are going to be like mine and heading off to school. The music that they listen to is abhorrent. And I would love it if <laughs> not listen to holy music. They all talk about the bag. They want to get the bag. And <laughs> well, like it's somebody else's bag uh-huh. of money that they got to go collect. And y'all, I will tell you the same thing about your sales goals. If you're selling real estate, it's not about how many you sell or what your volume is. It has to do with what you take home after a profit or profit so that you can then take that profit and turn it into wealth, which is wake up. And I'll say, have freedom. I'll be the wholesome one here. I'll balance. Okay, thank you. (laughs) I usually don't get to do this. I was told I got to do that today. I'm going to say so. so. And plus, you're in Austin. So I think it's part of your normal day to day. It is. It really is. It really is. I interrupted you. That's very. So that's the definition. So step one is understand the definition that it is not a number. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if Elon Musk is wealthy. I honestly don't know. Because I don't know. He's probably highly leveraged, which does not make you wealthy. Well, he probably is waking up and doing exactly what he wants to do every day. Yeah, but what part of me. You have changed the world, so we'll cut him a little slack. Yeah, I, you know. Rogan, Rogan probably has both, actually. And he's an old probably. So I'm really jealous that he's your neighbor. Probably. Here's the three ways to get wealthy. Number one, inherit. So you, you're born lucky. Cool. Good for you. Nothing wrong with it. Not me. Is that you? No. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're not, you know, when friends. No. But these days, like the baby boomer generation is starting to die and it, that wealth transfer is starting to happen. And some of them, like I have a client that inherited basically enough money to live the rest of their lives comfortably. They're around 50 and they're not splashy people. And their parents did it also not by being splashy people. They did it by, they were teachers. 
and they inherited a couple million bucks. And it was just through, honestly, they actually had an awesome stock portfolio. That was how they did it. So that's one way to do it is to inherit. And then once you inherit it, if you are really lucky to get that, I mean, obviously luck is not entirely part of it. You are going to have to go through probably some grief or like life situation. So that's number one. Number two is being the in the right place at the right time to have your skill set be able to take advantage of the opportunities in front of you. So if you're in the right place at the right time and you're able to grind and you know, start a business and benefit from that business in some way, that's another way to get wealthy. Now, you got to be sort of lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and have the right skill set for the right business. So that's another way. Wrapped up in that is all of this number two is what I call being the beneficiary of a tail event, meaning this is going to get a little technical. <laughs> Let's talk about statistics, the bell curves. Okay, there we go. At one end of the bell curve is like all the really good stuff. You know, you bought Tesla stock, whatever, 10 years ago or something, or you bought Apple stock 20 years ago or whatever you did. Or you ended up selling a whole freaking shit ton of cars to somebody in one small town and therefore you earned a lot of money. So a tail event is something that gets you really wealthy kind of really quickly, but that is probably not extremely repeatable either by you or other people, right? So again, nothing wrong with it. It just is what it is and it's probably not a repeatable strategy. So in order to maintain that wealth, you have to recognize that you are the beneficiary of that event and that you then need to maintain that wealth by being a little bit paranoid and probably getting a little more diversified, right? Because you got this concentrated wealth. The third way to get wealth is to get rich slowly. And that just means bringing in what? Spend less than you make. What? That's it. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I and I hate to lottery. break it to you. I hate to break it to you. Lottery's a I'm gonna call the I'm gonna put the lottery in the second category. That, yeah, that concentrated that. tail event. And Anything those, that is like look at all the lottery winners over time. Almost zero of them retain any of the money because they that's think because getting wealthy and staying wealthy are not the same skill. Not in the same skill. That's a great little quote for your package. Do you have it? It's from The Psychology of Money, It's which is the book that I make all my clients read. You know what? Well, I, did, I did. It's still on The Office. Remember on The Office where Michael said, you miss all the shots. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And he puts Michael Scott in big words. And in tiny, tiny letters, he writes Wayne Gretzky because Wayne's the one that said that. You could make <laughs> big letters, Sarah Palmer, right. big letters, right. Right. Uh, whoever said that in The Psychology of Money. Yeah. No, I legitimately do require every client of mine who comes on as an ongoing partnership client of mine, they have to either read the book, audio the book, or listen to the author's podcast. Because I can tell if within six months to a year, if that client has done that or not. Because when they read that book or digest that information, they are so much more likely to actually make their time and their treasure match their vision and their values so much more likely okay. because they ask you a question mm -hmm. real estate professionals own the balance so if this is not you quit taking it personally this is on the balance have an unhealthy relationship with money mm -hmm. as in when they meet with a client they are giving solid counsel very truthful detailed information when it comes to their own finances, they have blinders on. They don't know what's in the bank account. They bounce checks. They spend more than they have. They're charging things they shouldn't charge. And then they just figure, I'll sell a house to get myself out of the hole. So they're continually seeking a replenishment of funds, but it never solves the initial problem, which is an unhealthy relationship with yeah. money, which we also know is the core of most divorces. So yep. book, The Psychology of Money, do you find that it starts solving some of those underlying yes. issues with yes. healthy money relations? Absolutely. Because it's a collection of short stories. It's very easy to read. It's very easy to read. Like, we, you know, there's, uh, yeah, I like there's one of the chapters. There's only one page. Uh, that's probably the chapter. 
<laughs> yeah, but uh, in the Bible, they know they're all like juice of sweat. So like, see, you always are trying to find the shortest one. There's a one page right. chapter in this book. Right, right. There is a one page chapter in that book. But one of my favorite takeaways, this is not a particular quote from the book, but it's a concept that I live by. You will spend less if you just care less about what other people think about you. I swear to you. Have you ever seen that manifest in your husband's life since he's a real estate person? Oh, yeah, he does. He spends, yeah, he does not spend much money. He spends money on coffee. But you're not that man. He bought, we're in Benton, like I said, Bentonville, Arkansas, which is actually a great little town. We sort of picked it randomly. And that's a great airport, too. Oh, my God. How nice. Well, we drove, (laughs) but it was sort of random. That's lovely. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we drove, we were kind of staying nearby, but yeah, it's a great little town. I went to this coffee shop that roasts their own beans. So that's kind of his big thing. And he was like, he picked out the one that he wanted just based on the descriptions. And it was like 10 ounces of coffee beans for $30. I have no what? reference point for that. So I'm going to say, it was, oh, that's oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's just say in Austin, Texas, I mean, you could buy some fancy ass beans in Austin, Texas. And usually it's like 15 or $16 for both. Bang it, see. This Cadillac coffee. <laughs> this is Cadillac coffee. But, but that, you know. as you have wealth and healthy financial yeah. mindsets, it's okay to splurge on Cadillac. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the thing I tell clients is like, he doesn't spend money on things he doesn't care about. Like he spends money on things he does care about and that he truly gets enjoyment from. Like the kids and you, because children are yeah. expensive. And so you may as well. Oh, yeah. You're the ones so that we spend. We spend a lot of money on childcare. But that day's going to be over, and then you're going to be like me facing college. Oh, and so I'm like, like yeah, Stop. no, it's really fun. Read that book, The Price You Pay for College, today. I'm not kidding. The Price You Pay for College? What's the premise of that book before I read it? <laughs> so it is it's by a journalist that does mostly higher education reporting. Mm-hmm. And he just kind of breaks down what to look for when you're on the college search, like basically figure out what matters to you and your kid in that college search, and then how to look for those things in the school. Oh, that's, um, I don't and, want my kids indoctrinated. And if they're the quick <laughs> studies, I'm not paying for it. And third, if whatever I pay for, my kids are signing a note to me because they're going to have to pay me back because I right. can't finance retirement, but they can finance college, but I'm a better okay. than right. May. And right. oh plus in the government using this as carrot and stick right now is infuriating to me as a yeah. tax here. But you know, it's a whole different conversation. But the the other big thing in there is it talks a lot about how to get merit aid. Like what are the best like strategies for merit aid and you know that kind of thing. So you apply they're all a lot of it goes on un, uh, unapplied which is insane to me. I applied for everything, including like yeah. soil and water conservation scholarship, but I wasn't yeah. A soil and water student. I just, nobody else applied for it. I got a rodeo scholarship and I hadn't been to the Houston rodeo. Yeah, I know. Really weird. You weren't like roping and riding. You just applied for it. No. Yeah. It was in t- yeah. I swear. 10 grand. <laughs> okay. So we, we totally are rabbit holing here on college, but all right. So well, let's wrap our episode up because my people have no attention span. What is the one thing you would tell real estate professionals about financial planning after they read The Psychology of Money? So they've all raised their little right hand and written in the comments, you're going to read Psychology of Money. After or that, audiobook it or listen to the podcast. It's the Morgan Housel podcast. One okay. or the other. I don't think. We, we're not going to judge. After yours. After yours. But you probably should read it and get your little highlighter out because it's mm-hmm. how you read information. But anyway, after mm-hmm. we absorb the knowledge of Morgan... Mm-hmm. What's the next thing you wish they would all do, Sarah? Take your check that you get, and I want you to divide it into three bank accounts. I tell my people to do this, but I put them in four bank accounts. What are your th- I know. So profit, taxes, and then from your, so you put the money all into one. There is more complicated profit first system, which has like five bank accounts. I have found most real estate professionals just can't deal with that. So I have them in three. So you put the money into operating expenses. That's where you deposit it. You pay all your stuff out of that. But let's say you get a 10 grand paycheck. Congratulations. You just did a great job. Take about 10% of it every time. And immediately on the same day that you deposit the check, 
take 10% of that, so a thousand bucks, put it in your profit savings account. Do that every time you get a check because you are running a business, right? So do that first, pay yourself first, that profit, 10% profit. Now, depending on your tax situation, you got to talk to your tax professional, financial preparer, uh, planner to figure out about how much to save for taxes, but it's somewhere between 15 and 30%, depending on your situation. So ask first. Take that chunk that you've been told and put that in another account. And then every quarter, pay those quarterly taxes out of that account, okay? That leaves you, let's call it 60, 70% left. Out of that business, out of that 60, 70%, you shouldn't be running your business on any more than 30, any more, probably 25. So that means your life is being run at about 30, 35%. So that 30, 35%, that's your money to run your life, okay? The profit is like your quarterly bonus. So at the end of every quarter, you have built up this little profit account that has a few thousand bucks in it or a lot of thousand bucks in it or a hundred bucks in it, whatever. And you take that profit and you use that towards something you value. Use it towards anything except taxes and reinvesting in your business. So use it towards anything that matters in your life. It might be a debt pay down. It might be saving for retirement. It might be paying for college. It might be vacation, whatever. That is your quarterly bonus because you ran a good business. And if you get to the end of the quarter and there's nothing in that account, you need to prospect more and Mm -hmm. and some deals so you can have something in your account Mm -hmm. to play with. Okay. Love that counsel and advice. All right, Sarah. So if they want to come talk to you and find out how you could give them even more personalized advice, whether they are trying to figure out how to run their business or their household more wisely, what is the best way for people to find Sarah Ponder? Yeah. So we are realestatewealthplanning.com. And then on Instagram, realestatewealthplanning, we got an underscore in between each one of those words. So I'm sure we'll link to it. It's in the show notes, people. We know it's in the show notes. Swords and dashes. Don't stress. Yeah, and Don't stress. Math gets too. It's all in the show notes. I'm sure email's in there too. So Sarah at realestatewealthplanning.com. Um, but yeah, we'll schedule a quick call. And then if I'm not the right one for you, we will send you to somebody who is. I love that. Making sure it's a good fit. As we say in Texas, there's a butt for every saddle and make sure your butt fits the saddle. <laughs> That's right. What, what means too? And <laughs> You've also got to all read the psychology of money because you know that's your homework assignment before you reach out yeah. to yeah, see if you did. I mean, it doesn't have to be before, but I say within the first six to 12 months of when we start working together. Yeah. You know, she's going to ask you, so you may as well. I have, I have client, en- like, I have a client engagement standards document that you will sign that says you do it. I am not. Oh, really? That's awesome. I am not playing. I'm not playing. Well, I mean, because I'm, look, I'm not captaining a ship that's going to go down. I'm not captaining a ship that's going to go down. You were full of everybody else's little pretty <laughs> moment, but that I came up with. Put them all over your Instagram account. And, you know, on the internet, Abraham Lincoln said everything. So Sarah Ponder made pretty it. much. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. The show. Some great little insights and homework assignments for my listeners and viewers of all shapes and sizes, whether you're in real estate or out. This is good information to help you get a handle on your finances because whenever the economy is wonky, you do not have to panic if you are planning. So instead of panicking, do a little planning and check out all Sarah's information in the show notes. Again, Sarah, thank you for coming on the show and we'll see you sometime. All right. See you later. Thank you. So if you found value in this episode, please like and subscribe to this channel, turn on the bell and catch another amazing episode by clicking above. Crazy Shit in Real Estate is also available on all of your normal podcast apps. So if that's where you like to hang out, go find me, click subscribe. And most importantly, leave me a review that says you think I'm awesome, my guests are awesome, or this content is just exactly what you were looking for. And then by the way, if there's something you need, you wanna learn about something, you can comment below anytime. You can also send me a direct message if you need to remain anonymous, no judgment. But anyway, I'll only judge if you forget to subscribe and click. I'll see you next time.